Uh, for those of you who don't know Matthew Harris, um, <laughs> let me tell you just yeah. a bit about who he is. Um, Matthew is a clinical senior lecturer in public health at Imperial College. That's, you know, as you know, that's a pretty impressive place and you don't get to be a clinical senior lecturer there unless you are some kind of clever dude, which Matthew is. Uh, he's also a consultant to, to the uh, Na National Health Service in matters relating to research and policy in, matter, in, in regard, of course, to public health, which is his field. And, and Matthew, again, for those who are joining us who, who don't know you, why don't we just spend a few minutes in which you can sketch your, your background, uh, your journey to the posi position which you hold now, uh, and uh, what it is that you actually do. Thanks, Shlomo. I mean, it's, well, I think there's only probably two people on here that don't know. <laughs> <laughs> don't actually know me. I think my almost my entire extended family are on here, so it's lovely. Yes, to see but your you. entire extended family know you, but they've got no idea what you do. That's a very good point. You're very, you're quite you right. You've never explained it to them, and now's your opportunity. Um, I've I've actually noticed actually people often ask me over the years, you know, so what is it that you actually do? What is public health? So actually, it's a really great opportunity to clarify, I guess. Well, I, I, I'm London born and bred, uh, but I, I started um, really in, in medicine. So I, I went to medical school here at UCL, became a doctor. And for one reason or another, after I finished my house officer years, many of you will know, but I got ro romantically involved with a Brazilian woman and I, I moved to Brazil um, and, <laughs> and, and ended up um, having to uh, work there as a doctor, actually. So I was living in the northeast of Brazil in a very, very poor part of, part of the country there for several years, for about four years. And in that time, I had to actually requalify. I had to become a doctor there, which meant in learning the language. I had to learn Portuguese um, and I had to take all of their medical school exams, which I, which I did successfully. Um, and, and then I was able to work. And and I did so as a general practitioner. So even though I was basically fresh out of medical school, I worked as a GP so just, in their just, system. Just describe, Matthew, something of the geographic kind of setup over there, uh, this kind of villages, you know, to what extent it was a sophisticated environment. You said it was very poor, but uh, were there decent hospitals? Do people live very far from each other? What kind of environment were you working in? So I, I was essentially working in a rural slum. So if you can picture a favela, but yeah. spread out across a more of a rural environment with, with quite a lot of space in between each house, um, that's where I was working. Housing was basically mud huts. Uh, where there was no sanitation. There was no electricity. Um, I was working out of a rudimentary clinic that um, was basically a converted house. Um, one of the better kind of houses that they had in that particular village. Uh, it was actually made of brick, which was great. It had a few rooms, but it was a poorly stocked clinic with just a few basic medicines. Um, I had my stethoscope. I had a few dipsticks. Um, I had some about 30 different types of medicines, but I had a team. I had a team. I had a nurse and an auxiliary nurse and I had community health workers. We might dip into that a little bit later on as well. So it was, a, it was a very challenging context in which to do primary care. And of course, in that context, it's kind of a tropical, if you like, environment. We, we had an awful lot of diseases there that we don't have in this country, such as schistosomiasis and leptospirosis and dengue hemorrhagic fever and malaria. And obviously there was TB and we also had leprosy as well, which we don't really see here. So for, I suppose, a, a recently qualified doctor, um, I, I was, kind of thrown in at the deep end. Um, there, there were hospitals- where like, Pfizer's made clear it's not taken. There, there, there were hospitals- we'll, we'll just, uh, L, we'll just mute everyone, please. Thanks, carry on. No, that's I'll okay. Mute everyone. I just hope it doesn't meet the two of you. If it does, just unmute yourself. Okay. So there- So there were- there were hospitals that I could refer my patients into, um, but they were probably about 10 miles away by foot or bus that came very infrequently. We had very, therefore very little support. And most of the work that was done in that clinic was really the result of my clinical practice and the nurse and the, and the, and the rest of the team. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was quite a challenging environment, I won't lie. 
baptism by fire, if you pardon the expression. It really was, but actually it absolutely, that experience absolutely shaped the rest of my career. Um, because from there I went and worked um, in Ethiopia. Um, I was working for the WHO as a, as a consultant in a polio eradication program, which is essentially where we go all the way around the country in again, extremely harsh conditions, very remote rural settings that took, you know, there were times where it would take sort of 14 hours to travel by Jeep up a river because uh, there were no roads to get to the nearest, to the next village, to then speak with the healthcare workers that were there. So very, very challenging environments and, and ensuring that polio programs and other vaccination programs were up to speed and up to date and, and well supported. And then from there, I continued in, in my global health practice and, and ran an HIV hospital in central Mozambique, um, where there they actually have um, HIV prevalence of in the region of 30 to 40%. So more common than diabetes, for example, here. Very, very challenging. Again, very, very poor, impoverished setting, resource poor, but what, that, that work was funded by the US government um, to establish what they call a day hospital. So essentially for people to just be treated for their HIV. Yes, but, yeah. And then from there? Well, from there, um, I then, I think I, wanted to sort of hang my hat when it came to traveling so much and working abroad. I was missing my family um, and decided to come home um, when I, and I was able to get a position um, at Oxford University to, do, to study for a PhD. Um, so so that, that took me a couple of years. Um, and in that I was looking at, I was very interested in development, um, international development. So the way that we respond to development crises in poor countries, such as the ones I was working in, thinking very much around how not-for-profit organizations work, how do th those sorts of organizations decide how to spend their money and, and on what basis and who's really in charge and all those sorts of questions. Mm -hmm. So I did my PhD on that. And then that, that took me into the public health scheme, or if you like, for clinical practice within the NHS uh, so most, most and, people, I, and I completed my specialty people, training in public health medicine in the so, NHS sorry to interrupt in you, Matthew, 2014. Matthew, just to, sorry to interrupt you for a moment. M most people uh, will be familiar with the, with the term public health uh, and they know that it's something sort of quite important but very few people I think if you were to press them would be able to explain to you what public health is about, what the issues are, what the concerns are and what public health people do? It's a really good question and, th and thanks for stopping actually Shlomo and I should say that any anytime you want to stop just for and anybody, if anybody has questions do feel free to chip in it's no trouble at all. Um, so public health is essentially it's a, it's a, um, a medical specialty in the same way that cardiology is a me medical specialty, paediatrics, neurology, surgery, they're all medical specialties and public health is a medical specialty in exactly the same way. But it's not a clinical specialty in the sense that we don't see patients. What we do is our, our patients, if you like, are populations where the, it's the system as a whole. So public health doctors are concerned with ensuring that the, 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 the health of the population is the best it can be. And that we generally think of that in in three or four different ways. The first is how can we promote good health, right? What are the best ways to ensure that people have healthy lifestyles, healthy diets, uh, physical activity, etc.? The second aspect is how do we protect health? And that's really about how do we ensure that things like epidemics, pandemics, COVID, Ebola, those sorts of things that are contagious from one person to the next, how do we ensure they don't spread? So that's called health protection. And then the third thing that we talk about is called um, healthcare public health. And that's one way of thinking about it is how can we design our system of healthcare to best meet the needs of the population? Do we have the right balance of hospitals versus primary care clinics? right kind of skill sets in primary care? Do we need to be thinking in certain different aspects of the healthcare ecosystem to meet the needs of the population? So it's not when they're in the clinic, make those decisions that make, they're in the clinics, they're treating patients one at a time, one in, one out, and so on. 
of healthcare, thinking about it not at an individual level, but at a population level. So these are the big picture things. Right. Yeah. So uh, given your experience then in these uh, developing countries and these very poor areas and with um, you know, challenges and circumstances, when you moved then into the area of public health, which of these four areas of public health was the one that grabbed your attention? Did you hear the question? Well, at, yeah. in actual fact, thanks, Shlomo. So, in a, uh, and the connection's a little bit bad. So, if I freeze, it might we might just need to be patient. But the um, so I actually moved into academia, um, which is the fourth aspect of public health. It's what underpins all of public health. If you do research, that informs all of the different policies. We try to, through research, influence government, influence the private sector, influence the primary care networks and GP practices and so on through our research. So I actually became um, a what's what we call a clinical academic, which means I'm a consultant in public health, but at the same time, I'm an academic. So I work within a university setting um, and doing, doing research and writing policy papers and so on in order to influence people and practice at large. But in, ter in terms of the translation, I think, which was the second part of your question. So in terms of the, what were the things I suppose that I learned from having worked in low-income countries when I returned to the NHS, I think one of the to, to put it in a, in, a, in a nutshell, I think I learned actually that there is a lot we can do in the NHS that they do in low income countries. In fact, there's a lot that's happening in, in low income countries we can learn from. Um, many of the, um, there are many aspects within our system that are highly inefficient, very fragmented, very costly. And having worked in those settings, I, I came across multiple examples of what we might call innovations um, that actually do exactly the same thing that we do in terms of clinical outcomes for individuals, in terms of um, safety uh, as well to patients, but at a far, far, far reduced cost. Um, these, these are what we call frugal innovations. So Can you these give us are practical examples? Absolutely. Um, I, I, I imagine quite a lot of people on this call have had a hip replacement <laughs> or a knee replacement or something similar. And um, if they haven't, they're going to. So thinking about orthopedics as an example, in Uganda, um, they're going to. <laughs> um, it so happens that in orthopedic surgery, whether you have a fracture or a knee replacement, whatever it is, at some point you need to drill a hole in a bone. You need to have a drill at some point during an orthopedic operation. And the, the drills that we have in the UK cost £30,000. And the, and the reason they're so expensive is because they're encased in this very sophisticated steel you know, encasing, which allows them to be put in an oven and sterilized without killing it because of all the electrics. So the steel encasing allows it to be baked in an oven, what we call an autoclave, to sterilize the equipment so it could be used in an operation. Of course, it has to be sterile. And that's why it's so expensive. And in Uganda, they couldn't afford, obviously, to, to procure that sort of equipment. So they innovated. They did what's called a frugal innovation, a workaround, let's call it. Um, and they took a Black & Decker drill that you would use literally to put up shelves in, in your house, uh, the equivalent of that. And they put the Black & Decker drill inside a bag, but the bag is sterile. So if you're careful, you can put the, the drill inside the bag and close the bag under sterile conditions. And then you've basically got exactly the same, functionally, exactly the same kit that we have here in the UK, but at the price of a bag and a Black & Decker drill. So it's probably about hundred pounds all in. So you're looking at functionally exactly the same kind of outcomes. And there have been studies, there's a, um, a hospital in Baltimore in the US, uh, a trauma hospital that's begun using this drill uh, for the first time um, ever in a high income setting on trauma patients. And they're finding that there's absolutely no difference in outcomes mm -hmm. between the very expensive drill and the, and the hardware drill. So that's one example. So in, in would you be wanting to recommend that to the NHS? 
I have been recommending it to the NHS. In fact, I have a PhD student at the moment who is exactly looking at that as, as at how can we adopt this frugal technology in the NHS? I'll be interested to hear your views about it because actually, you know, a lot of people might think, well, you know, that's a bit dodgy, you know, that's a hardware drill. I'm not gonna have that being used on my hip. But the truth of the matter is, there's no such thing as kind of sterile. It's either sterile or it's not sterile. You can't use something in an operation that is kind of sterile. So it would only be used in the NHS because it's sterile. The challenge is, is overcoming the barriers, cognitive mostly, perceptions around the technology itself, because it might look cheap, it might look not quite as sophisticated, and of course it comes from Uganda. And if I bring my own drill, will the operation be cheaper? Absolutely. So we actually calculated that if you were to swap out all of the all of the uh, the hardware drills that we use in, in, in the NHS at the moment and overnight started using the drills that we, we've suggested, the NHS would save 100 million pounds. Goodness me. Yeah. Goodness now, me. All right. I think um, other examples. In case. Say again. Other examples. Other examples. Yeah. So um, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if some of you have already had a hernia. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're full of tonight, that. aren't you? I mean, how old do you think that we are all, all of us as participants here? <laughs> Some of us are still quite healthy, you know. Well, uh, you know, it can happen. You believe, Don't you insult that. your audience. <laughs> you pick up something too heavy, you can get a hernia, even young people. So hernia operations, you may know already, um, they, these days we treat them by taking a piece of mesh um, and you put it inside the abdominal wall and it reinforces the abdominal wall and makes it stronger and then the hernia is cured. Now, don't confuse this with the kind of mesh that we've heard a lot about in the news that's being used in a, for a different application and has caused lots of problems. This kind of mesh... So which, me which mesh are you referring to there? A vagin vaginal mesh. Oh, I see. So right. Things like uterine prolapse and other things. Yeah. It's been used in that setting and it's not. It, it, it's had a lot of issues. But for inguinal hernia mesh, it, it's very, very safe. Um, so in India, as it happens, there's an Indian surgeon who realized that instead of buying mesh that comes pre-sterilized, it's a commercial offering, it costs in the region of 300 pounds for a unit of mesh, probably no bigger than that. Um, instead of doing that, he actually looked at the material and realized that it's made of the same material as a mosquito net. Um, and in India and in Rwanda and elsewhere in sub-Saharan Africa, there's an awful lot of mosquito nets. And so it makes sense not to, you know, procure a very expensive 300 pound piece of mesh when you can cut the same size mesh out of a mosquito net, sterilize it and, and use it in a hernia operation. And there have been dozens of randomized controlled trials. So these are the types of studies that definitively demonstrate whether one type of intervention is better or worse than another type of intervention. There have been dozens of these studies that compare the commercial mesh, the expensive mesh, with the mosquito net mesh, the very, very cheap variety, and find that actually it's identical in terms of safety profile, in terms of the likelihood of what we call adverse events. So the mesh failing, or there being an infection around the mesh, or having to take the mesh out and put it in again for whatever reason, or there being another prolapse or another hernia, its effectiveness, its safety pro profile is identical to that of the expensive mesh. And so they use it in India routinely, in sub-Saharan Africa routinely. So I ask the same question, Matthew. So is this another recommendation you've made to the NHS? They must be loving you. Well, I'm not sure they do, actually. <laughs> I, I meant that cynically. We can we can get to that as well. So no, that is another recommendation we're making for the NHS, and we've got a paper coming out hopefully soon in the British Medical Journal that argues quite convincingly, we think, that um, that that the hernia mesh that's being used by the, for, or made of mosquito nets is that is we should be using it in the UK. There's an interesting, there's a, I, I think, and this is what we write about in this piece, is a, quite an interesting contradiction when it comes to the mosquito net that we think is a, um, a represents a really glaring double standard. 
which is that uh, the mosquito nets need to be sterilized in a particular kind of way, okay? Um, and the commercial mesh is also sterilized in that way. But the sterilization requirements in the UK are quite high, about 137 degrees um, in order to ensure that the mesh is sterile. And there's some evidence to suggest that mosquito nets, because of slightly different pore, pore sizes and other things, in some instances, the mesh can warp at such a temperature and so therefore isn't safe. And so it needs, you need to use another approach to sterilize it called ethylene dioxide sterilization. But the UK side say that eth using the ethylene oxide sterilization process puts us at risk of prion disease transmission. You may remember what prions are. These are what, what causes mad cow disease. Mm. Obviously, it's very important. We, don't, we want to ensure that you know, prions are killed right, during the sterilization process. Um, and so they argue that therefore it's, it can, should only be used in low income countries. Yes. And the you, you definitely don't want to have a mad cow hernia. No, no. <laughs> definitely not. No. Um, so I don't know if you can hit, you can work out the double the double uh, standard there. But essentially, the argument then is it's okay for patients in low income countries to be at risk of prion disease, even though that's only a theoretical risk. But here in the UK, it's not okay. And that, I think, really reveals a kind of an interesting double standard in global health, actually, which, which can be slightly problematic. Yes, I want to come back to that in a moment, but I just want to ask you about some of these innovations. You've been speaking about two very specific innovations um, at a more sort of systematic uh, level in terms of overall structure of, of practice, the way in which patients flow through um, the relationship between GP and patient, etc. All the stuff that we see at primary care and then the interface between primary and secondary care, the point at which one transfers across to a hospital or to an emergency room, etc. And then practices within hospitals themselves. Are there things that we have learned from other places that in a similar way could impact advantageously on the UK in terms of efficiency uh, and therefore outcomes? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. So we don't just look at the technologies and surgical, you know, uh, technologies and other things, but we also look at system level approaches and, and how to design the system. And one that I think is particularly important and one that I've been working on now really for 15 years since returning from Brazil is the use of community health workers. Now, um, if I can try and summarize the reason why this is important, I think um, in the UK, um, we've, we've, we've gone down a path where general practice has become very much focused on clinical care, individual clinical care. And whereas 20, 30 years ago, I think a family doctor, the, your family GP, you may remember, was actually would always, you know, visit you in the house and know the family and know the background. And to a large extent, I think we've lost that. We've lost that, uh, that sort of what I might call the household health intelligence that's really important to understand an individual's experience and understand an individual's health circumstances and what makes what's making them ill and and, and how we might support them to get better <laughs> yeah. it's about how can we recreate our system in, in primary care in 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 the u right growing up in south africa it was absolutely normal for the gp to come around visiting and to make house visits etc to be a friend of the family to be a you know confidant uh, etc um and uh, it was a great shock coming to England to, you know, to have lost all of that. And, and actually, sometimes I think that the only person who still plays something of that role in the community is the community vicar or rabbi or whatever, you know, who's with the family from, from, cradle, to, from cradle to grave, as, as the GP used to be. And, and we've lost that, as you rightly say, in the UK. Slim, I, I, um, I think I got most of it. I'm sorry the connection was bad. Um, but to, to your point, absolutely, even in South Africa, you know, where you have that experience of the GP coming visiting you, we, we have, I mean, other than a few really exceptional gen, uh, family doctors, which I know my father-in-law, Alan, has had some fantastic experience with his, his GP. We've lost a lot of that in the culture of primary care. 
in, in, part of that is of course the workload, but part of it's also this overemphasis on clinical care. And the Brazilian system I think is very, very interesting. And I learned obviously having worked in it for several years, I learned a lot about it. And they, the, the very simple innovation that they did in Brazil was the use of community health workers that have responsibility for a, for a number of houses that they visit every single month, essentially, whether they have any issues or not. And in doing so, they build this sort of rapport, this relationship with all the household members and the entire community taking responsibility for all, all of their health and social care needs and being able to refer into the GP as and when required. And that system has been proven to be extremely efficient and effective and has been scaled across the entire, the entire country um, to great effect. I, Shlomo, you've frozen on my side. I don't know if you can still hear me. At all. No, we can hear you. We're fine. Oh, we're you fine. can. Hear. Okay, all right. Yeah. So, so we over the last fourteen years, we've been trying to actually implement the Brazilian model here, and because of COVID, to a large extent, I think people are beginning to realise there's a burning platform. We've pumped what is something like four hundred billion pounds out of the economy and into responding to COVID, which makes the health system completely stretched and under-resourced. Um, and we need to find new ways of delivering models of care that actually, where you get more bang for your buck and recruiting and training more GPs is, is not the answer. It takes 15 years to, to recruit and train a GP. Uh, by then we'll be in a whole nother, a new world. We have to think of a way to support primary care in a nimble, quick, easily delivered and deployed system. And the use of community health workers, because they are lay members of the community, don't need to be trained for 15 years to, to do that work. They can be trained in four weeks and provide the kind of support and community facing uh, household level um, interaction that supports the role of the GP in a much more effective way. But Matthew, wouldn't uh, technology be a, a, a cheaper and more efficient way uh, you know, you've you mentioned COVID and one of the innovations of COVID is that we are now beginning to do things over here, which my brother-in-law, who is a GP in, in uh, Toronto in Canada, has been doing for years. And that is seeing the majority of his patients online uh, and they're sending him their photographs online, etc. And he's uh, talking to them, he's visiting them when he needs to, but a, a lot of the work is actually being done over there online. And we're just discovering that, isn't that cheaper and more efficient um, then uh, training human beings to go out and who are not doctors to go out and to visit homes? So I'm, I'm at risk of coming across as a bit of a Luddite here, Shlomo, and I, and I, don't want, I don't mean for that to be the case. I think technology is um, very useful in the way that you've suggested to, to enhance the role of the GP in situations like this. But the technology um, uh, through video consultation or, or other examples um, is only useful for people that have chosen to speak to their GP. What about all those people that haven't chosen to speak to their GP or don't know that they've got a reason to speak to their GP yet or don't want to speak to their GP? The problem with the system we have at the moment and what technology actually exacerbates, not helps, is we don't know what we don't know. So essentially, when you're sitting as a GP in a clinic, you don't know what the problems are out there in the community happening day in, day out. So you might know your patients that are known to you, but you don't know the people that you don't yet know that haven't yet come and seen you. And the, the reason why the community health worker role in Brazil is so incredibly interesting is that it's uni what we call universal. Nobody is left uncovered, so to speak, by the system. It's completely universal. Every household is looked after, so to speak, by a named community health worker who visits them every month. So even if those people in that household don't think they have a problem, by visiting them each month, when problems do eventually arise, the community health worker is able to identify that um, and support them or signpost them in, refer them into the GP, say, have you thought about, you know, speaking to the doctor about that mole that looks a bit worrisome? You know, those sorts of things where they haven't yet really seen it themselves. And it's, and it's that that makes it a, what we call a proactive system. Our system in the UK is inherently what we would call reactive. All we can do is react to what comes through the door. 
um, and we do that very well, but it's still just reactive. The system in Brazil is complete paradigm shift to what we have in the UK because it's actually proactive. We f they find what's happening in the community and support them before those issues become problems and before those problems become clinically serious and before those clinically serious conditions end up in hospitalization. So by acting what we might say is upstream in the role of the community health worker and operating, if you like, in a way that's completely universal. So no one is left Un, un sort of discovered, so to speak, their system is really very, very effective. And I'll just give you an example of that. The system has scaled now to the entire country, which of course is the size of America. It's absolutely enormous, Brazil. And in some of the most harsh conditions, remote regions, it covers now 75, 80% of the population in Brazil. In areas that have this model, compared to areas that don't have this model of primary care, there's a 14% reduction in mortality for cardiovascular diseases like strokes and heart attacks. Mm. That's 14% reduction. Now, that's unimaginable in, 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 our, in, in a high income country to have that much impact, not with a pill or a, a type of operation or a type of technology, but just through the actions of single individuals operating at a very large scale. So, so when you come along uh, with your recommendations of these compelling arguments, what sort of response do you get from the government or from NHS and from those people who you're trying to persuade for the last 15 years? Well, Shlomo, I'm embarrassed to say it. it's taken this long, but really this is a very real problem that we have when you're trying to adopt innovations from these sorts of countries. Because the kind of reactions that I've been getting, and these are just direct quotes as examples, would be things like, well, what can we learn from Brazil? Does Brazil even have a health system? You know, Brazil's a very different country to the UK. You know, it might work there, but it's not going to work here. You know, these are snap judgments, we might call them, you know, sort of uh, knee-jerk reactions, in part because they're hearing the word Brazil before they're looking at the evidence. And one of the things that's quite frustrating when you work in public health sometimes is that it's really not a science you know we think and this and that but really we oftentimes don't science is also a very social process and people interpret evidence we might say in ways that are not necessarily particularly scientific um, so we can be easily influenced by where that evidence has come from is, there, is this um, just a very so this, polite this sort of if you like uh, resistance sometimes matthew is this just a very polite way of saying that we're being very snobbish and because we've heard brazil or some other third world country we say as uh, a uh, world well, it's not for us we are first world um you know this is not a model that uh, this is not where we look for our uh, for our um inspiration you know we look to you know, Western countries, you know, advanced medical, advanced healthcare systems, etc. Don't go, don't come to us with stuff from primitive countries. Is there's this, is this this element of snobbishness or or arrogance or or dare I say it, a residue of colonialism that is that's at work here. Well, I think so, and we've done a lot of research that seems to prove that that is the case. So, um, uh, I you know, I think. I think the, uh, it's understandable given you know, the way that some of these countries are represented perhaps in the media, the way you know, they've been portrayed over many, many years, um, you know, this notion of you know, Africa as being in need and this and that. It, we really haven't kept pace with the changing global health landscape, we might call it, where now Africa, which has by and large responded far better to COVID than we have in Europe, um, is, has hotspots of innovation that are just simply extraordinary. Um, and because in our, maybe in our consciousness, we're not yet ready to sort of think of them as contexts where, that we can learn from, we, we aren't keeping pace with that. We actually, um, we've, we've, done, we've done research into this, robust controlled studies, I won't bore you with the technicalities, but that demonstrate that if you, if you give an, an English clinician some research and say it comes from Harvard University, and then if you give that same English clinician the same research, but say it's from the University of Mizuzu in Malawi, 
they will rate that same research much, much worse without realizing that the type that the authorships have changed. OK, mm -hmm. so, you know, this this what this represents is, as you say, very much a snobbishness, perhaps it might be rooted in the sort of colonialist you know, attitudes and legacies. It's difficult to really get into the mind of the person to know what the reason is for that attitude. But it's very clear that we don't interpret evidence necessarily, you know, as objectively as we as we necessarily ought to. We pay attention so, to some of these external cues, we might call it. So when when you um, come to NHS and you, you know, uh, with a with an innovation, either at, at the sort of um, structural level, um, overarching uh, level or a specific innovation that pertains to a particular operation of one form or another of the kinds you, sp you spoke to before. Who are you, who are you speaking to? Who's, who, who you, who's listening to you? And um, you, you said it's, you know, there's a social process over here. What's, what do you need to do to break through this, this barrier so that you are heard and the ideas are taken for what they are? Um, and evaluated for what they are and then ultimately implemented. Who, who's your, what's your conduit? Who, who are you connecting with? And what sort of level within the, within the NHS? Is it a bureaucrat well, or is it somebody that, at the very top? And where's the closed mindedness coming from, I guess is what I'm asking. Thanks, Shalom. It's a really great question. I think I'll answer it in two parts. The, who am I speaking to depends a little bit on the innovation we're discussing. Um, but if we took the Brazilian family health strategy, the Brazilian model of primary care that I've just mentioned, I've mentioned I've been in meetings with the um, with the chief executive of the NHS, with the chief executive of Public Health England, with the uh, chief medical officer of England, with the chief medical officer of Wales, with directors of public health in multiple regions, with leading GPs, with the clinical director of the National Association of Primary Care. You know, over the years. These are the sorts of levels of, you know, people that, that we that we present the evidence to. Um, and, you know, there are so, some of those in, as individuals are very receptive to, to the evidence, but on their own, are very, it's very difficult to, uh, to implement something like this just on their own. And so to your second point is how do you affect the change is the, 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 the ideas have to become sticky. They have to become um, socialized. People have to come round to it eventually, and partly it's by looking at who else is interested in in this innovation. And can we, you know, can we work with those people? Can we do we like who's liking it? That's part of it. So just this week, we've actually we've we've still, despite these challenges, and it has taken 14 years, but just this week, Westminster Council is has approved a potential pilot for this model, and this will be the first time in the UK. So it's very exciting. Um, and there's a little piece actually in Camden New Journal that came out about this this week. <laughs> so it's very topical. But, but it just goes to show just how long it can take for the NHS to change and adopt some of these ideas that, yes, they're complex in themselves, but a large part is because had, had this model be first been um, originated in America, I imagine we wouldn't have had half as much difficulty getting people to pay attention to it. In fact, South Africa is now trying to implement this model and Belgium is trying to copy what South Africa is doing. So the way the innovations flow around the globe is quite interesting. In, in terms of being sticky, Shlomo, this is also, I mean, I think I had to be sticky um, is a large part of it. I came back from Brazil in 2004 and I was a no one. I was no one, you know, I, 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 I had left this country, I'd given up my medical career in the UK, I'd gone to some back end of beyond country that no one really knew anything about and I had returned. And I was no one, and, but I had ex an experience where I knew that this was a system that actually would benefit the NHS, but I didn't have a voice. In order to get the voice, I had to get my masters in public health because you can't, in this system, you know, you're nobody unless you've got a masters. But that wasn't enough. I had, I couldn't get, I, you know, even if I had a master's, I didn't have any a position of authority. So I had to get more experience in global health to become, you know, to have some kudos. And that wasn't enough. I had to then get a PhD to be able to, you know, this is just to give you an idea, getting a voice. It's not about the idea itself. It's about who's the, who's the messenger. And yes. people you have, have to have a platform. You have to have a platform. Um, and I didn't have, a, I haven't had a platform since when I got back in 2004. I now have a platform and, and I'm 
developing that influence and people are paying attention and it's getting published and now it's getting sticky and Westminster is now interested. Cheshire and Merseyside are interested. Wales, Public Health Wales are interested. Um, we've got Brent, uh, local authorities being interested. We've got the National Association of Primary Care all now, you know, working out how we can do this at national level. But why didn't you have, why didn't you have a, a, an attempt at Camden, our, our own bar? I mean, the, the, the councillors at any rate, you know, uh, and from Keir Starmer down, you know, um, you know, a conversation with Keir Starmer about something like this as the, you know, uh, and or indeed for Tulip Sadiq, um, you know, the two MPs who are the south and the north of the, of the borough, mm. are both very, very open-minded people who, you know, would really be interested in this, particularly if Westminster is going for it. And they, you know, they would, they would press the, um, the public health people, you know, to, to talk to you and to be open to this. Absolutely. Well, that that will be on next on our list. You know, it's it's kind of kind of like a game of skittles in a way. You know, you sort of, you know, get so if Westminster buy into it, then we have got proof of concept, and then other boroughs will be interested. They'll look at Westminster and think, "Oh, that looks okay. We can do that." But getting over that first hump of that of, of Westminster buying in and actually putting some skin in the game and actually investing in it as an op as an opportunity yes honestly take it takes a long long it's taken a long time to do and it's a terrible shame because we miss the opportunities yeah yeah let's uh, let's open this uh, for a few minutes to anybody else has questions and um, unless you've got any slides that you want to show us anything of interest uh well i think i've i think i've discussed most of it to be perfectly honest with you um yeah i don't think the slides right. would add very much all right, so folks uh, who, who are with us, if anybody wants to ask a question. Can I, uh, may I ask a question, please? It's Diane. Yes, of course. Uh, Matthew, hi, Matthew. Um, this community um, program that you want to, so who will the community worker report back to? Will it be like a social work system that you, you have a, a senior social worker that, that you report back to? How will that work? So we're proposing that it works exactly as it does in Brazil, where the community health workers, usually around between four and six community health workers per GP, would work with the GP. So they would be predominantly working in the community. So they they start off in the clinic, they chat with the GP, discuss any issues, etc., and then go out and, and spend most of their day in the community visiting their households. And then at the end of the day, come back to the clinic and, and discuss and report any difficult cases and those sorts of things. So they'll be, if you like, line managed by the GP and the practice nurse. And that's very important because it's predominantly a health role. Um, so even though they're not health professionals, but it's predominantly a health role, but they'll be line managed by the GP and the nurse. And are they, are they medically trained? These, these community workers? I mean, what's their training? So you froze them. Oh, what's that? Are they medically trained? No, they are oh. lay people. Um, Diane, you'd make a great one. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> they, <laughs> you they, are, they are lay people who, who, who are just simply emotionally intelligent, have an interest in their community. They understand the importance of health. They want to help but they're able to be trustworthy and keep a, you know, confidentiality because of course you're speaking to your neighbors essentially yes. about quite intimate, you know, household situations at times. So it has to be a sort of basically a trusted member of the community that can represent that neighborhood. And we're only talking about 250 houses per community health worker on average. It, it's not much more than six to eight streets in, in Northwest London, is it? So it's and not some, a huge area. Comes but they're not medically Somebody comes in, a health worker comes into my house, um, my, my wife and I, et cetera. Uh, what kind of conversation does she have and how long does she, does she, does she stay here? That, re that really depends. Um, it, there's a lot of variability and flexibility built into the role. So in some houses where there might not be very much happening, they'll just be in there, they'll have a cup of tea, a chat, you know, and then move on. Um, in other household, households where there may be um, a, an isolated elderly person living on their own with multi multiple health conditions, 
struggling to, you know, adhere to their medications properly, you know, not really able to make food for themselves or other things, they may spend more time. Um, in other households where they might have a, a mother who's pregnant with two young children, they may spend a bit more time as well because they might need to talk about the immunizations and the screening programs and all these other things. But there's flexibility built into it. The really important thing is that no month goes past without every household being visited at least once. Just so you check in, light touch, just checking in. Because that way, at, for month to month, even in any household, even my own household, you know, things happen from month to month. A GP wouldn't necessarily think of me as a person as, a, you know, a high risk of anything or something that uh, he, needs to know, he or she needs to know about. But things do happen. People suffer from mental illness. They might lose their job. They might um, develop diabetes without realizing, you know, all sorts of things happen. So by visiting every month, every household, those things can be picked up far more effectively. Any other questions? Anyone? Uh, Matthew, hi. hi. Matthew? Hi. Hi. This is, hi. Um, really, really fascinating. Um, have you considered a the amount of data you'll be generating from all these community health workers going out into the field to work and, and, uh, and survey the very broad community? Have you thought of a digital solution that could enable that service rather than it to be essentially paper-based and sort of vocal? Because I can imagine that will be um, that will be difficult. I have a motive because I may have a digital digital solution that could <laughs> that could help you. But but nevertheless, is is is, is that you know if you look at what Babylon Health is doing with the GP service and essentially making it. Um, yeah, data intensive, but but also handled completely digitally. Do you think there's a, a role for a, a digital health solution within this service? I, absolutely. I mean, we talked already about you know the role of technology to enhance healthcare professionals' role rather than replace it. So I think definitely. And in Brazil, they actually do use now um, digital solutions for community health workers in mostly in the richer areas, such as in Sao Paulo and Rio, to store data, upload it to the cloud, um, use it for data-driven decision-making as, as decision tools for clinical diagnoses. They, they're not health professionals, but in Brazil at least, they can diagnose a child with asthma or with dehydration or malnourishment, not so much an issue in the UK. And having the guidelines to follow in a very sort of protocolized way is very useful. And they have digital solutions now for that. We, uh, we've, if I'm honest with you, um, we've been focusing mostly on the human resources side of it, trying to just get the boots on the ground. But there will definitely be conversations if we can have, if we can get that far where the boots are on the ground to look at digital solutions to, to, to support that role. And you'll, it sounds like you, you're aware of this, but the NHS is extraordinary. There, there are 100,000 different IT systems in use in the NHS currently. A hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes even in the same hospital, you've got wards using different IT systems from other wards. So the, people often don't realize it. And one of the one, it's a branding miracle that the that people still think of the NHS as actually an, an entity of its own as an organization when it isn't. It's a highly fragmented and complex array of different organizations even wards operating almost autonomously at times and yet we think of it as a single system it's quite a, it's a marketing miracle um so so when you talk about what's the digital solution for the community health workers a lot it remains to be seen where we would be implementing the community health workers because we would need to work with the gp practices and the systems that are compatible yeah. with yeah. their practice That's a good point thank you Pamela, Pamela Rose, you've been uh, have a couple of uh, items you've put up on chat. Do you want to um, ask your questions? Can you see Pamela's chats? Yes. Oh, sorry. Am I? I'm reading it out. Uh, yes, I asked so... Pamela, but she hasn't hasn't responded. So, but it's it's there on the I... chat. Okay, so there's a question here around, is it more of a role for the, as like a social worker? And um, saving, saving money for the government. Saving and and, and uh, Brazil has one of the highest rates of uh, casualties to COVID-19. Yeah, so that, that's, I'm, you know, I'm not going to lie, that is absolutely the case. But um, 
there's no counterfactual in the sense, you know, what would the rate have been if they didn't have the community health workers there? One of the peculiarities of the Brazilian context is they, uh, at national level, have political leadership that's a bit like Donald Trump, you might know, um, very much undermined the public health community's efforts to control COVID. Um, so whilst the community health workers are there front and center, advising the community, providing sound public health advice, at the same time that's being contradicted a lot of the time by what's being seen on TV by their actual presidents as well and the sorts of messages that are being said. Um, also, there are part of the reason why Brazil had such a high casualty rate was of course, when you think about what's the secondary care infrastructure like in Brazil, and in towns like Manaus, which is in the middle of the Amazon, which you may have seen on TV, they only had like one intensive care unit for a population of probably about a million. So, and that's in, in the middle of the Amazon as well. So just imagine the complexity there. So it's not to say that community health workers are therefore not you know, useful, they, they absolutely are, but we're looking at extraordinary circumstances with COVID that very, very few countries were really actually adequately prepared for. So I think it's a different case. Can, can I say, add, sorry, can I, I add that um, I had to call the doctor a few months ago. I spoke to three community health workers, repeated it all on the phone each time, and eventually a doctor rang me back. Um, so we do have community health workers here. Uh, I don't see advantage uh, at all. I think we need to put more money into the NHS and fund more trained nurses and doctors. So I, I absolutely take your point, Pamela. There are people that work in the community as health workers, but they are not the community health worker role that I'm describing in the way that they have responsibility for a defined geography, that they visit every household in that area, irrespective of health and social care need, and that they work as part of the primary care practice. Those are the three fundamental differences. It's so, a different role. It's a different role to a doctor and a nurse. It's a very different role. We have, you're quite right, we have lots of community services, social care, health trainers, peer support workers, health visitors, district nurses, but they all work in silos in an vertical way and explain your point. That's why you spoke to three of them, right? You need somebody who can just understand you as a whole and your house and your family and your health, your whole I health need, situation. I need a doctor. You I need, need a doctor. I needed a doctor not to repeat everything three times to get transferred to a doctor. It was okay. all quite really. But the point is that you're talking about a different role. You're That's talking right. social function, uh, that there ought to be within the community people who uh, show care and visit, uh, particularly now in COVID. I know a lot of people have, don't know who to talk to when they've got various... But that's a different role to a doctor and yeah. a nurse. So right. I agree with what you want, but we mustn't call it healthcare. It's, it's social health as opposed to medical health. I think you're absolutely, you make a really good point. And the, 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 be, because it is this hybrid role where it's not just looking explicitly at health, we have to be careful that we don't label it too much in that space. But what we do think is that by having it integrated into primary care, because really GPs and the primary care system is the go-to uh, statutory part of the system, if you like, to resolve most people's problems when it comes to health and social care. That's why we, following the Brazilian model in particular, is why we think it's the, it, the best way to op operationalize <laughs> You're quite right. A large part of what these individuals do. Uh, just uh, an observation about this. You know, you've spoken about the fact that there has to be attitudinal change, and that the system, this particular system, uh, is a, a massive shift, uh, a paradigm shift, from passive to active, uh, from uh, reactive to, uh, to, um, to to active. And I just wonder what happens when this very lovely person who's, you know, been to somebody's home and finds out, you know, that there's a bit of tension over there between husband and wife and sort of heading towards divorce, something like that, the kids are a bit stressed. 
comes back and reports this to the GP, who is used to sitting there waiting for somebody to come and oh, call in for her services. Uh, and the, there's a huge attitudinal change that's going to have to have to happen with the GP himself or herself now to do something with this inf information and to initiate a contact with this family. And that's a big ask, isn't it? No, that's right. But uh, I think it has to, it, these things are to support the care that the GP provides. So it's, it's you know, at the beginning, at the initial stages, very much when these, the system is implemented, and this is what they saw in Brazil, you see a huge upsurge in, in the kind of cases and things that the GP needs to resolve because the community health workers are exposing, if you like, um, what we call unmet need, unmet demand. Um, but eventually it sort of equal, it reaches an equilibrium over time where, and, and so what ends up happening is that the GP ends up seeing people really that he or she really needs to see from a clinical point of view um, and not have to deal with what in the UK is around 40% of his or her workload, which is having a chat, you know, just people come in because they're lonely. Yeah. Um, or whatever it might be that's stuff that can all be done in the community yeah so yeah. so what it does is it releases capacity in the system and right. you have the right people seeing the right cases at the right location yeah. and it organizes the system a lot better okay. all right well we're going to bring the uh, this uh, very very fascinating conversation to, to an end uh, and i suppose in some respects matthew you've got uh, the most exciting of tasks and, and in some respects the most unenviable of tasks Exciting because you you see things happening in other places, uh, which are which are innovative and exciting, which you know can make a difference uh, to uh, in in the UK, uh, to individual patients and to the whole healthcare system as well in terms of efficiencies and uh, improvements. Unenviable because you have to spend your life trying to persuade people who um, are kind of don't really want to listen for all kinds of reasons. Uh, NIH, not invented here, comes from the wrong country, it's uh, the wrong, whatever it is. Uh, so um, it uh, must be very frustrating for you on occasion, while at the same time, very innovating to be able to, you know, feel a passion for the exciting ideas that you see, and the frustration that people are just not taking it up with the same level of enthusiasm because of social block as opposed to medical evidence. So uh, thank you so much for sharing with us some of your world. Uh, and can we wish you in enormous success, you know, that your voice should be heard uh, by those who need mm -hmm. to hear it and that there should actually be uh, the implementations that's going to make our society a better and a healthier one. Thank you, thank guys. You. It's a pleasure. Thank, thank, you. You. Uh, thank you so much. Great.